Didi fam, welcome back. What's up, guys? <laughs> We're back again. What's, What's going up? on, Mike? D Sport has some news for us. So we got good news. Um, I don't know yet. They said that they checked a bunch of stuff. They've measured everything out and they want us to go over there to get an update. And I hope that it's good news. We have 61 days left in Telsema. An insanely short amount of time. Oh, geez. No. Oh, oh no. No. It's on a love cap, boy. Oh, geez. So like I said, we've got 61 days left. Dame is in town now. It means that uh, we're gonna be a little distracted here. But we have a lot more work to do on the car before we go over to D-Sport today. We're gonna get cranking on that. And uh, we gotta fix some stuff that Damon broke yesterday when he jumped in the car for the seat fit. That tube is uh, no longer tacked in place. Remember when I said that this pedal is so much better than the factory throttle pedal? Well, it is. It's a lot stronger, yeah. but it doesn't fit in this chassis. It's like basically resting against it. So even if we chopped all this out, we still wouldn't have very much travel. So we're gonna use the stock pedal after all. Stock pedal goes back in in its nice little mounting position and now we can shift everything back, move it over a touch to do that. We're actually gonna cut this tube out, unbolt the pedal assembly and make another flat plate here with some slots that will move further back so we can position everything, test fit it, make sure we like it and then we can figure out how to uh, do the final mounting when we move on with the roll cage fabrication. On a very high horsepower car, you don't wanna have three quarters of an inch of pedal travel where it's zero throttle and 100% throttle. It makes the car so hard to drive. So you actually want a throttle pedal that has some travel to it. We're gonna throw the stock pedal back in there, make everything fit a little bit better. So we redesigned that plate. We'll cut this new one out on the plasma table, tack it into the car again. We'll have Damon sit in the car again later on and then we can move forward. So we got the pedal assembly bolted onto our new plate here that has the holes slotted about 40 millimeters further back. We're also shifting it slightly closer to the throttle pedal since we have more clearance there with the factory pedal than we did with the Tilton pedal. So able to get this, the pedals lined up actually even better, um, a little better for heel toe. Getting toasty. All right, back in the car with the factory throttle pedal. I'm actually kind of tippy toe right now. So if I was gonna push the brakes, my leg is completely extended flat, which is a good thing being that we are in the seating position for Damon. He has longer legs than I do, so he will have a little bit of bend in his knees. That'll be perfect. When I move the seat forward into my position, probably right around here. Oh, there's the cap that Damon shot off yesterday when he <laughs> stopped on the brakes with nothing connected. So there's a little dust cap on the master cylinders to stop stuff from getting in there. So the factory throttle pedal feels okay. It is a bit soft. The throw on this is okay, so we have a decent amount of travel. With the tunnel and the throttle pedal positioning is actually pretty good. So three quarters over on my foot, throttle pedal down, the side of my foot is right near the side of the firewall. Yeah, this looks good. I think the only thing we have to check now that we moved the pedals over closer to the center, the steering column, we might have an issue on the other side. It looks like from the center of my driving position, it will go right past the brake pedal, which should work out. That's going to work. I'm just gonna double check the other side of the firewall to make sure there's nothing that's going to obstruct us there. But I think we can get a, a steering column in here right next to the side of the brake pedal. will fall right there. I feel like the steering is really centered up, which is nice. Some cars, you have to put the steering wheel offset a bit and it feels weird when you're driving it. Other cars actually tilt the steering column at an angle and that also feels weird because your driving position and where the steering wheel is cocked sideways one way or the other. So it just has kind of an odd feel in the car. The old school Cobras are like that. You actually sit super sideways in the car. Um, actually this way because the trans tunnel is so big and the inside of the car is so weird. But the steering wheel is pointing one way and the pedals are pointing another way and you're kind of like frosted up in the car. It's a really uh, interesting car to drive. I think we'll probably shift the brake pedal over since it's adjustable. We can actually move these bolts over to the side a little bit and shift the pad over so this is a little closer. There's a bit of a reach there. You can do like a big twist over but I like to do more of the roll style heel toe. That'll give us a little more room on the clutch pedal as well so our feet aren't touching in between here. And overall, I'm liking it. This feels good. As far as positioning goes, the steering wheel to shifter, this is looking pretty good. I think this is right about where the shifter is going to sit. We may have to cut this out a little more. That is not a big deal. 
This will go right around there, steering wheel nice and centered up. And then we have a good amount of room here to put our e-brake in. E-brakes, I like to have a little bit more forward. So the transition between the steering to the shifter doesn't get you know, basically interrupted by that right in the middle. It also gives you a little better leverage. If you're too hunched back here, you don't really have, you know, good pull, good feel. So having it kind of extended arm almost to grab and pull, it's pretty ideal. And I think that actually is gonna work out really well. We have a good amount of room in between the shifter and the steering wheel. It's gonna work. It's gonna work really good. You excited, Tim? I'm excited, Mark. Man, dealing with this F12 build, ordering all the parts, not having any money. You know what? I just need to take a break. It's time to play some video games. So most of you guys are already familiar with the Insta360 X3 camera, but they just came out with this brand new three suction cup vehicle mounting system. And it makes putting your Insta360 onto your car, your truck, whatever it is, so easy and it's stable. This is a one person setup. It literally sets up in a minute and you're good to go. This X3's brand new half inch sensor captures the action in vivid 5.7K 360. Choose your favorite angle after the fact with easy reframing tools in the AI-powered Insta360 app. All right, so we had it on the back of the car. Now we're gonna put it on the front of the car and just get a completely different perspective, a bit of a unicorn shot. The Insta360 triple suction cup car mount provides a unique third person perspective when filming your ride. An all new revised design provides a solid, sturdy mount for your X3, ensuring your car content looks seriously next level, all while guaranteeing a safe and stable support for your camera. The Insta360 X3 camera paired with their brand new triple suction cup vehicle mounting system, it's an absolute game changer. Complete your Insta360 car set now with the newly released multifunctional durable brand suction cup. Combine convenience and quality. Purchase your Insta360 camera and essential accessories in one easy step. Click the link in the description to get an exclusive offer just for DDE fans. 25% off the One RS, a free selfie stick or a lens guard, a free 128 gigabyte SD card for the first 50 buyers. Don't miss out on this exclusive deal just for the DDE audience. Yo, what, what time is it? Oh. Oh man. All right, so now that I'm happy with the pedal box location, we've decided to go with the factory pedal. We can move on to some other roll cage fab. And the next tube that I wanna do is the header. So this is a very important tube because it ties these two bars together. Without this tube across here, if the car did roll over, this tube could fold in very easily. It wouldn't have a lot of strength, so it could just basically crush down, fold in. That's not the idea of a roll cage. We wanna tie this in, but we also wanna make sure we get it up as high as possible, even though it is a bit further than where the driver is sitting. There is a chance that the driver's head or passenger's head could make contact with that bar. So we're gonna try to put it in this uh, little groove here, just like we did with the A pillars on the side. It's on a weird bend. It's next to two bends. It's going up and it's gonna be rotated about 45 degrees that way. So I'm gonna make it out of some thin wall cheap tubing first, cut and tack together, just like we did with the template for the A pillars. I measured across here, it's about 43 inches. I'll mark that out on a tube, cut that, and then I have a piece of scrap here that had a 17 degree bend in it. It actually looks like it fits pretty good. So I'm gonna try this first, but keep a longer piece of tubing on it and then see if I can get it right the first time. So I'm just gonna remake this. I've got 43 inches across and that's giving myself probably about an inch and a half extra on each side. So we'll cut that at 43 and then we'll chop the tube in half. That way I can basically mirror it and do both bends, both notches. Just keep trimming down that center to get the tube to be the exact right length. Then I can get the measurements off of that and make it properly the first time with the correct piece of tubing. The reason that I'm using this tube, it's thin wall tubing. It's very easy to work with. It cuts quick, it bends quick. It's also, it's very cheap. So this is about, I think it's less than $2 a foot where the other stuff is four times that much. This is just the more economical and easier way to go to uh, mock everything. I'll start chopping this up, notch it, bend it, fit it in the car, see how we're looking. All 
right, so we got our tubes marked out where it's gonna get bent and where the notch lands. This is measured exactly. I've got uh, basically a punch mark where the hole saw is gonna go. And then I have the scribe line this way for the bender so it rotates right and the start of the bend. Now that I have all this measured out, when I make the other part the correct one, it will be exact. I'm just gonna confirm that the notch is correct. And yep, that looks good. So uh, I can put in the bender now, bend it 17 degrees on this mark, do the same on the other side, pop it in there, and then all I have to do is basically trim this down, get it the correct length end to end, tack it together, and we will be good to go to make this out of the correct roll cage tubing. So I just pulled it out of the bender and I just want to confirm that the bend looks the same on both of these because this one was really hard to measure the bend. Couldn't get an accurate measure off the back of the tube because it was smashed. This, I couldn't tell if it was really at the end of the bend or if this was cut properly. Then I'll put this piece inside the car, make sure it looks good there and then I'll bend the other side. All right, let's see if this thing fits. See, that looks pretty good. All right, I will bend the other side up, match this one. So now that we got both tubes bent and notched, measured the roof to find the center of the car, marked that, I marked each tube at the center. We're gonna pop those in now. If it all fits well, we'll tack it together and we can make the correct piece. Almost spot on there. I think it might need to come back a little more, which means it needs to get a little shorter. Yeah, I don't know, actually, that's pretty I think much it. pretty good. I think it just, like, the mill. Yeah, it might take, like, a millimeter off, maybe two millimeters off, but the notch fits really good. Everything looks really good. I think I might just sand this down a little bit. It should be good to go. Now that we have both these tubes trimmed up, I took just a little bit more off of there, probably about one to two millimeters. Those A pillars come up. We were just a little too far forward, so we'll get that twisted back a touch. I think we're good to go. We're gonna tack it in place. It's one of the other tubes that finishes off the main, the basic structure of the cage. So it'll be good to get this out of the way. Then we just have door bars left, down tubes, harness bar, diagonal, a couple tubes here and there. <laughs> We're almost done, right? <laughs> All right, let's see if it fits. That looks pretty good. It is nice and tight. So it's falling forward because the A pillars move out, but when it's in the right spot, I think it looks pretty good. All right, so the test tube fit perfectly. Now we can cut it out of the proper tubing, mark it out, get all of our uh, bends in it, notches, everything ready, put it in the notcher, cut those notches, bend it up, put it in the car, tack it in place, and then we can go over to D-Sport and check in on what's going on inside of our engine. <laughs> I missed. I completely missed. I should put my helmet on. <laughs> the no look pass. The no look, like it did time. not work for me this time. I missed it by uh, an eighth of an inch. My turn. Come on. <laughs> All right, first try. First, first second try. <laughs> I got it that time. Boom, first time. <laughs> All right, that looks really good. I'm happy with that. We are moving along with this project. 61 days left, and we have a half a roll cage and a pedal assembly. <laughs> oh, oh boy. I'm not even working on this car and I'm stressed out. Now that we have our header bar done and tacked in place, pedal assembly mocked up in the correct position now. Now I can uh, move on with finishing up these boxes. So they're gonna get shortened a bit. So uh, we have less um, intrusion basically into the uh, driver compartment for driver, passenger ankles and all that. Shorten that up, finish that plate. Still have to make door bars, but that's gonna be, I might even run tubes through the front firewall to the shock towers, but I wanna wait until we have the engine in before I do any of that stuff. 
We may add gussets. There's a lot of other stuff that we can do, but the main parts that we need to finish are the diagonal bar, which goes from the passenger side, uh, bottom of the main hoop up to above the driver's head. And then harness bar, we've got the two down tubes that are coming off of the main hoop, basically to the uh, rear shock tower area, even though this isn't a McPherson strut car, so it doesn't really have a shock tower per se, but that's a strong point where we're gonna land it. That's all stuff that we have to do. But the first thing that I need to figure out is fuel system placement, fuel cell. We need to find a good location for that, measure the amount of space that we have, order one hopefully that's off the shelf and hopefully that's already complete because if it's a custom fuel cell or one that's not in stock, it usually tends to take about six weeks. That would uh, not work well with our timeline. Here's the factory fuel cell that we took out of the F12. So it's actually a very nice piece. It's all aluminum, fits in the chassis really well. But now that we've added the quick change diff, we had a problem with contact with the bottom of this area here. It's also, I think this thing holds 24, 25 gallons, something like that. It is a lot of fuel and we do not need that much fuel for this car. So an option is to cut this thing down, basically chop it and use a section of it. But the main problem with this tank is that it is not made for a race car. So it doesn't have baffles inside. It doesn't have a surge tank, which means something that is holding the fuel and not sloshing around. Also inside of a fuel cell, there's foam. It's a, an open cell foam that slows the fuel down from sloshing side to side. So it keeps the fuel pretty level in the tank and you can run it down fairly low. Where a lot of cars from the factory, once you get below a half tank or maybe even three quarters of a tank and you're on track and all the G loads are basically making the fuel slosh side to side. You're going through the S's, you're on the brakes, you're on the throttle and that fuel is basically just sloshing around everywhere in there. And that could be a huge, huge disaster especially on an engine like this. Twin turbo V12 at 1500 horsepower. There is no room for air in the tuning. And if the fuel was sloshing around and the fuel pumps picked up air instead of fuel and pumped that in, the injectors would basically fire half fuel, half air. It would run lean and we could melt a piston, it could detonate and uh, spin a rod bearing, it could throw a rod, it could crack a block, crack a sleeve. The biggest and most important reason that we're putting the fuel cell in is for the baffling system and for the safety of that fuel cell. So this tank is just a layer of aluminum. It can get punctured and basically split open and spill all the fuel out. The fuel cell is a shell, an aluminum shell, and then inside of that shell, is a bladder made out of a special material. Sometimes it's almost like a Kevlar type material. If it gets punctured on the outside, that shell on the inside collapses, twists, and it is very puncture resistant. So most likely you can have a car that's wrecked really hard and the fuel cell will look completely mangled, but it will still hold the fuel and it won't spill out, which as you know, fire is terrible in that kind of situation. If you get in a wreck and you have to get out of the car quickly, but you've just rolled your car over or something and maybe you're unconscious and your car's on fire, that's bad news. We are definitely putting a fuel cell in this thing. I need to find the best location for an eight to 10 gallon cell. That's all the fuel that we'll need for this car. That's the next big step basically in moving forward with this project. All right, so since uh, Damon has blocked the shop door with a Hummer, we're gonna take the Hummer since we have to move it anyway to be able to close the door. So it was an easy decision. All right, let's see if this start works. That's <laughs> Good to go. Good to go. You ready? Oh, we got the safety lights going. We're going to D Sport. Just follow us. Sure. BMW power. <laughs> Let's get the lights, Eric. Let's get the lights going. Woo! Taking it through the woods. <laughs> Everyone behind us is getting all like dusted out. Look in the mirror. <laughs> Mike, there's a dip. Mike, there's a dip. Oh, woo! America! Hey, what happened to Eric? Why is he so far away? <laughs> Wait, did he slow down for that dip? He, I don't know why. He must not have 33 inch tires on his BMW. <laughs> so we're almost at D Sport. And well, I'm hoping for good news because 
He just said that he had an update for me, but he didn't really go into detail with uh, what was going on. I'm really hoping that there isn't anything wrong with any of the parts that's gonna set us back even farther. Like we already know that the crank was slightly bent and that's gonna have to get repaired, but we still haven't found out about the cylinders, if they're reusable, how thick they are, if we can source other cylinders, see if they can machine something else down to fit in the stock location and maybe go a little bit smaller on the bore and go with a smaller piston. There's just a lot of details they're figuring out for us. We are at D Sport. We're gonna check on the block and the heads. Hey, what's happening? How's it going? Good, good, how you doing? Good, 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 good to see you. Good to see you. See you too. So yeah, I have a little bit of news for you. One of the heads right now is in the CNC. We got the block here uh, with one of the sleeves got out of it. Oh, cool. And I could tell you what we had to do to kind of get there. And then over here, we've got the cylinder head. This is where I think we're gonna spend the majority of our time well, getting guys, this thing ready. You guys so, done a lot of work to it already. Trying to get all of that buildup out of the exhaust port. Usually, direct injection engines are notorious for intake valve deposits. These intake yeah. valves weren't bad at all, but it had a bunch of junk on the exhaust side. Yeah, so, it was pretty built up in there. Yeah, and it's like almost like corroding and fusing itself to it. So we determined the only way to do it would to be fully polish the exhaust port. A lot of what we have to do is literally by hand with strips of different sandpaper of different grits and kind of going through by hand and then using a Dremel and stuff to work through it. So yeah. we're gonna have a few hours in these heads to get them, to get them all cleaned yeah, up. But, but they look like, I mean, it's like a mirror. In yeah. There. It's gonna get even better than that, but yeah, <laughs> we want it so that that carbon has no place to stick. Yeah. So the smoother you make it, there's there's really nothing for it to stick to. And I think with some of the design changes we're gonna do on the piston, I think that's gonna help us get some better oil control in here yep. and alleviate oil and stuff that must've been coming up through those rings, getting in this combustion chamber and getting stuck in the exhaust port. Yeah, I think actually Tim has the rings, Tim. Oh. To me. So I've never seen an engine with this with this thin of yeah. rings, except for a uh, Porsche Motorsport race engine, it was a two ring motor. This is pretty wild that it's in a street car. Oh, and Look it's still that. a three piece. Yeah, I, I've, never three piece. I've never seen a three piece oil control ring that's this thin. I think, what did we say? It was like a millimeter and a was, half or Yeah, something? one and a half millimeter like wow. stacked together. It's crazy thin, because that's usually the thickness of like the middle ring. Yeah, right? normally on an oil control ring package, they're about anywhere from three millimeters, 2.8, 2.5, that's your common one. And then a really thin one is usually a two piece and it'll be a two millimeter. Yeah. But to get a three piece and one if I've never seen anything like that. The lighter your rings, the less inertia um, they're gonna have when they're going at, at super high RPM. So they're not gonna flutter, they're gonna stay where they wanna be yep. and, and get the job done. Less friction as well, right? Yep. Yeah, less friction as well. And it also helps to get that seal in the bore if the bore's not perfectly round and stuff. It is, it's a little bit more conforming the thinner that makes it is sense. too. Yeah. We don't really need this thin of a ring. Yeah. You know, Ferrari, they did an excellent job of engineering. They used pretty much every trick in the book as I pulled this apart to get as much horsepower out of the, out of, as they could out of this, you know, yeah, in that normal motor. aspirated. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that is very, very impressive. Just the way they transition from the port into the two valves, it is so smooth. Those ports are crazy. And the chambers in the head, everything is like top notch. Mike, I'm gonna give you a few of our secrets here, okay? All right, cool. These don't look like the most sturdy clamps out there. Yeah. But in fact, when you're holding a workpiece, you never wanna put too much stress in it. Oh, you just you... wanna put the right amount of stress in there. And if you can figure out a way to cut it and machine it or do whatever you're doing where you're not inducing a lot of stress, yeah. you're not gonna deform this as much. Exactly, as, so if you did some crazy clamps, you could actually warp it, you machine it, and then you take it out and it's warped the other exactly. way, right? So it, it goes back, so. Yeah. So we use these little, you know, woodworking clamps yeah. um, to do that. Now, once we have it on here, you'll see we have a fourth axis in here. So that allows us to rotate, uh, uh, rotate 360 degrees. We already got everything leveled out, but once we do, we put it on here and you never know exactly how well the manufacturer did in, in matching the flatness of this surface to yeah. this surface. They should be parallel. Yep. And on the first head that we cut, it was under a thousandth of an inch in variance. Wow, that's so really good. So it was, it was pretty good. This one had a little bit more from this side to this side. We can go through, we have this actual uh, probe here. And with this probe, we can go to any location. The probe will sense a touch in any direction. So if you, if it goes from the bottom, see how the light turns oh, green yeah, yeah. or left or right. Anytime you, you hit this, it's gonna, tell the computer, hey, so we have contact. Like touch off and then, yeah. Exactly. Along. So we can go down here, touch right, 
there, just get it barely touched. So you're right. the light down just to where the light turns on. Exactly. Yep. So we could zero that out there. So now our Z, our Z there is zero. Yeah. And now we can move it and bring it to the other side of the head and touch off here and see how much difference we have. Okay, so now we touch here and you see we're at zero again. Yeah. So we were able to use that fourth axis to line up the head perfectly this way. So yep. now we're flat across here. Now, unfortunately, there's a little bit of variance in this head. So as we go across this way, what we want to see as we go here, we want to see another zero. Yeah. Nine tenths of a thousand, 90% of a thousand. So yeah. not too bad at all. We're so going to make it perfect. We're going to switch tools out here. So we'll switch the tool out. So now, oh, nice. <laughs> so that's, now a, that's a nice fly cutter. Yeah, yeah, this is that's all it is, is a big fancy fly cutter with a lot of mass to it. You have a lot of mass, you have a lot less chance you're gonna get any type of weird vibration or anything yeah. in the tooling and stuff. So we can use different types of cutters here, everything from cerametallics to regular carbide, CBN, which is a cubic boron nitride, which is the second hardest material to a diamond, huh. and PCD, which is polycrystalline diamond. That's the hardest one out there, and that's actually what we have in here. So this is gonna be a diamond cut on here and I'll leave it light, a really nice, almost like a rainbow finish on it. We'll first just line up our Y. So our Y is the is the center of it this way. So now we're zeroed on the Y. So now we just gotta tell the machine exactly how far away this is from here. We can just lower this, and when it gets zero here, Oh, you know it's, that distance already. That is, distance is exactly three inches. I was gonna say three so inches. So now we yep. just tell the CNC, hey, our tool is three inches away from the surface we want to cut. Yeah. So now it knows. So that's it. So now we're set up math. <laughs> <laughs> we were a thou low on that side. So we're gonna cut just a thou and a half. We should touch everything. Yeah. Um, unless there's a little dip or something in there. Make sure we're not hitting anything. If we're not hitting anything. We can go ahead and start that up. So that's spinning at 2000 RPM. We tell it what direction. We want it to move 40 inches in the X direction. And we're gonna tell it to feed at six inches per minute. So you can see it's snowing in here now. Yeah, it is. That's that's, that's how, how little, little is material coming off. is taking off. Yeah. It's an aluminum snowstorm yeah. right now. It's like little tiny curls. Doors closed on your own CNC machine. We're only leaving it open here because we're trained professionals <laughs> and we want to get you good shots too. We have a little bit more to cut, but that's okay because we're gonna it's gonna go back in here and get the same service again after we do the final valve job, after all the polishing the ports, all that's done. It's gonna come in here and get a final one. And then depending on how that comes out, sometimes we'll even do a, a hand lap on top of it. So that would just be to get every single little one of those lines out, yeah. right? So you get a perfectly flat like, surface. Like the RA of this is probably, I don't know, five or six or something. Yeah. Once we do that, if we hand lap it, we can get down like one or two. It's yeah. like nothing, yeah. That's crazy. That was uh, really cool to see. Thank you so much for showing. No problem. Us. No problem. Yeah. I hope the hopefully we'll have some news for you. The next thing we're going to be doing is redressing all the valves, get them all up to spec and stuff. And they look good. They all look saveable, which is good because there's 48 of them. Yeah. In this engine, so we want to save them. Yeah, exactly. But no, they look good. I think we can get that all going. Yeah, we're going to order the material to make the plates that are going to let us do the valve job. Yep. And the plates that it's going to let us do the honing on the cylinder. Yep. I'm glad that we can reuse the cylinders because that mm -hmm. saves a bunch of time. Bunch of time and money. Yes, the unicorn SEMA car. It has to actually run. Well, that's the know? idea. That's the whole deal. That's the idea. Any so chance that we running. can get it on the dyno? Uh, absolutely. Okay, good. Yes. Good. All yeah. right. Yeah. That. Uh, I mean, the dyno is right here. Yeah. Yeah. All the engine work is getting done here. It only makes sense that we're going to run it on I the mean, dyno it's, here. It's got to sound twice as good as one of your BMW or one of my Nissan engines. You know, being a V12. Exactly. So that's all I'm thinking. I mean, the cool thing about this engine is it's so much just like an in inline six. Yeah. I mean. Just doubled up. It's yeah. doubled up. Yeah. yeah. So we don't have to think too too differently about it. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's just you're doing twice as much work on the heads. I know. Exactly. The clock's not so bad. So. <laughs> cool deal. Well, awesome. thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. See you soon. All right. See you soon.
awesome visit to D-Sport and a lot of good news. So we're gonna be able to reuse these cylinders, which uh, was a big concern. The money obviously is an issue, but the biggest thing is time. We don't have a lot of time to get this build done. And Damon wants this thing running and driving at SEMA. We have 61 days left. Pistons that are getting made, that's gonna take about four weeks. So that's like 30 days right there. We have rods that they said might take eight weeks. Well, that's not gonna work. We're gonna have to try to get them to speed up that process if possible. I know that CP Carrillo already has their machines running 24 hours a day. so. I don't know how they're gonna do it, but I'm just gonna cross my fingers right now and hope that they can make us 12 awesome Carilla rods in time to get this thing all assembled, put it in the car, tune it, and then get it to SEMA. There's a long road ahead of us, not a lot of time. Complete your Insta360 car set now. Click the link in the description to get an exclusive offer just for DDE fans. 25% off the One RS, a free selfie stick or a lens guard, a free 128 gigabyte SD card for the first 50 buyers. Competition, but if you go against me, you the opposition. But if you want to look like you could close the distance, I'm gonna give it a for ever since you're so persistent. Uh, with you, I'm just practicing because I'm back to back. Let's get back to winning. As a matter of fact, I'm not that forgiving because you did this to yourself. That's a bad decision. I don't see no one in front of me. 